the uh, I first saw Josie and the Pussycats when I was 21 years old, and the movie was new in theaters. And around that time, uh, some of my buddies and I would just go to any movie that came out because uh, that's much better than studying. <laughs> and so. Uh, over the course of the last year, I've talked to dozens and dozens of people who love this film, because not only did I talk to the cast and the crew, uh, I talked to a lot of fans about keeping it alive during the years when it was just considered a box office bomb and a punchline. And uh, one of my favorite things is, I, I enjoy these weird little things. As you can tell, I talked about the Soska sisters thing where they were extras. Um, uh, those guys also remembered a scene that nobody else remembered, because they were extras and they were excited to see Katie Isabel. And so when I mentioned it to the directors, they were like, we had that? That was so much better than what we did. We should have kept that. Um, uh, Alan Cumming, uh, you remember Zero Effect? Yeah. So everybody remembers. <laughs> I used to hand sell Zero Effect at the video store like crazy. It's my favorite movie. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if anybody knows this. Uh, NBC in 2002 or three had a TV pilot for Zero Effect where Bill Pullman was replaced by Alan Cumming. Mm. And so one of my great pleasures in doing this was just talking to Alan Cumming and kind of tricking him into talking about the Zero Effect pilot. <laughs> uh, and so that, that pretty much, that means that two of the, the th two of the like five movies I probably hand sold the most at the video store are represented <laughs> in the book just by default. Um, now, uh, as, as, uh, as movie nerds, I know that like some people are gonna buy the book that, uh, that don't love Josie the way I do, and I encourage that because I'll take their money. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the great things is how many weird little stories happened that had nothing to do with the movie or only tangentially related. Uh, there's a guy called Hiro Kanagawa. He plays the Japanese delegate in the international thing. And Hiro, uh, I knew him from, from iZombie. It's a show that I covered. And uh, when I talked to him, one of his things was he worked on Best in Show with uh, Parker Posey immediately prior to this. And he was like, she recognized me in the cafeteria on the first day and then sat with me every day in the, in the cafeteria while I was working and then she was just the classiest woman in the world. And so it's all these weird, like uh, Tom, Tom Butler who plays Agent Kelly had like this weird trajectory of stories where he talked about working for the Chinese government in a movie where he played MacArthur and they were no dressing room so he had to get dressed next to uh, like this like, Chinese woman and her baby. And then they go to shoot a scene where they're using Mao Zedong's actual airplane. Uh, and then cut to a couple of years after Josie, he was telling a story about Freddy versus Jason, where he hurt himself on the set, but that's the take that they had to use. Because he had to break down a door, and it was locked. It wasn't supposed to be. But it was the only door they had for him to break down. So if you watch that movie, when he breaks down the door trying to rescue his daughter, like... After that, immediately after that, he had to go to the hospital and get stitches in his finger and his face. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, and, uh, and so there's a lot of weird things. Uh, Kevin Smith told me that this movie is why he didn't do a commentary track for Zack and Miri Makes a Porno. Um, yeah, this, this movie, uh, Universal had a weird thing where they would do the commentary track after the movie came out. And as a result, when this movie came out and bombed, and then the following Monday they were doing the commentary track, there was a lot of gallows humor on that track. Uh, the uh, Deb at one point, uh, they had another producer on, Mark Platt, who's, who still works for Universal now. And Mark was like, oh yeah, and the next movie we do, and Deb just cuts him off like, they're not gonna let us do another movie after this. <laughs> and, and Kevin Smith was like, when my movie bombed, I thought about that, and I'm like, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> uh, now, you know, this is, this is a unique movie. Uh, this was obviously supposed to be a big, dumb commercial hit. You know, we talked a little bit beforehand about uh, the Flintstones and Viva Rock Vegas, which the writers of this did a pass on to try to clean it up. And it kind of became the opposite. It became this weird niche movie that everybody said, oh man, this is way smarter than it has any right to be. And so uh, I, I hope that when you're reading this book, like one of the things you take away from it is that the folks who made this movie are they're, they're really nice, really talented people who busted their ass and put way more work into it than it needed to be for what easily could have been a cheap IP cash grab. You know, this could have been the Flintstones 3 uh, or Scooby-Doo. Uh, and the fact that it wasn't is both why it failed at the time and also why we still talk about it now. And so uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed watching. I know a couple of you hadn't seen this movie before. 
but uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Oh, that's okay.